enjoyed Thanksgiving on Thursday, all the turkey and the stuffing and stuff. <laughs> you get to recover now for a little bit. I mean, then again, it's Christmas time. My wife's going to be kicking into Christmas cookies here at some point. There's going to be Christmas cookies in our house till probably the middle of January. <laughs> but as we enter into this Advent Christmas season, there's many things that we get to think about, that we get to prepare for. But this morning, I want to begin our celebration with a question. What is hope? What is your idea of hope? What do you think of when you hear hope? And I came across this illustration that I found fitting for this topic. A man approached a Little League baseball game one afternoon. He asked one of the boys in the dugout what the score was. The boy responded, 18 to nothing and we're losing. Boy, said the spectator, I'll bet you're discouraged. Why should I be discouraged, replies the little boy. Our team hasn't even got up to bat. Now, I don't know about you, but many of us, your team's down 18 to nothing. You're just going to resign yourself to the fact that, man, okay, this other team's got it all together. They're hitting. They're playing really well. And our team just did decided not to show up today. They decided to stay in the parking lot. It's, not, it's just not worth it. Like, we're not going to be able to come back. This little boy, though, looks at this guy and goes, well, why should I, like, our team hasn't got up to bat. He had this hope that when his team got up to bat, they would be able to pull something together and make a comeback or at least make a march to try and overcome this other team. Well, hope is like that. Hope is that feeling of, well, maybe, just maybe, this is still possible. What is hope in your life? For some, well, hope is that first candle you light when the power goes out of, okay, we're going to be okay. We're, we're going to be able to see what's going on. We're not going to be in the dark till the power comes back. Or, I mean, I can relate to this next one. The first day you wake up after suffering a cold and not being able to breathe properly. Praise God for that. Hope is that percentage that you're given by the doctor when they say, there's this percentage that you can beat this cancer. For some Hope is that faint line for the woman that's been struggling to get pregnant. Hope is hearing those words from the doctor, your loved one's going to be okay, surgery went well, and they're resting now. Hope is ultimately the fuel of faith and dreams, and that is what we're celebrating this morning on this first Sunday of Advent. So what does Advent actually mean? Well, it's a season of hope, and the meaning of the word actually means coming, or arrival. And the season is marked by a couple things, expectation, waiting, anticipation, and longing. And like I said, many people assume, well, Advent's just this extension of Christmas that the Catholic Church uses just to add something else into their services. No, it's so much more than that. It offers us the opportunity to join and share in the ancient longing for the coming of the Messiah, to celebrate his birth, to be alert for his second coming. It allows us that opportunity to experience the excitement that was felt when the prophecies were given and people were waiting for the Messiah, wondering when is he going to come? When is he going to be born? How is he going to arrive? And then for the people that had the privilege of being there when he was born and seeing him, we get to share in that joy of the coming of the Savior. But then we also need to be alert for his second coming, as we're told in Scripture, to be on the lookout. We don't know the day or the hour. Advent looks back in celebration at the hope fulfilled in Jesus Christ's coming, while at the same time looking forward in hopeful and eager anticipation for his coming kingdom. Now during this season, we wait for both. So it's ultimately an active, assured, and hopeful waiting. Typically, though, and I, I know we can all relate to this, Christmas is marked by a frenzy of things. You're busy shopping. You're busy decorating. You're busy baking. You're busy trying to make plans with family. I mean, gracious sakes, this week, I was out here Sunday night pushing the piano. Thank God that thing is on wheels. I was pushing it across <laughs> the front of the church and my mom just happened to be walking through and she goes what are you doing i'm like gotta get ready for christmas and there's just this busyness that's going on but advent is an opportunity for us to set aside time to prepare our hearts and help us place our focus on a far greater story than our own 
the story of God's redeeming love for the world. It allows us to take the time to dig deeper into what it truly means when God sent his son into the world to be Emmanuel, and we all know what that translates to. It's right on the screen. God with us. It's a season of expectation, preparation, and opportunity to align ourselves with God's presence more than just a hectic season of presence. I mean, I love presence. Like, I love getting gifts. But there's something to be said about taking the time to align yourself with the heart of God and the true meaning of what this season really is all about. So I want to invite you to take time during this season. Over the next couple weeks, take a moment to reflect on the true meaning of this season. Prepare your heart for His coming. Now this should be done more than just on Sunday. You don't just come into church on Sunday and be like, okay, I got my fix for the week. As you go throughout the week, you should take the time to quiet your heart. Find that time that works for you and reflect on all that God has done, all that he's going to do. Advent is not a celebration that God comes to fix things. Rather, it is a celebration that God comes. He comes to be with us. He is God with us. He's God with us in the darkness, in the pain, in the chaos. He comes and makes a way. I know for some people sitting here this morning and even watching, Christmas is a time of year that you dread because it's another reminder of that loved one that's no longer with you. They're not there to celebrate with you. But this year, I want to encourage you, instead of dwelling on that, dwell on something positive, that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, over 2,000 years ago, came, was born as a baby, came among us, walked among us, fulfilled prophecy, paid the price on the cross, and he is preparing a place for us to be with him one day. Now before we dive into the heart of what it means when we say that God with us brings hope, it's important to look at something, and I'd like to refer to it as the long journey of hope. Now many of us here were familiar with the story of Adam and Eve. When God created them, Everything in creation was perfect, just as he intended it for a brief moment. It was exactly as how he wanted it to be. He walked freely and openly with Adam and Eve. I mean, for gracious sake, Scripture tells us he would walk with them in the evenings and talk with them. He was among them. But then they made a decision and chose sin. And this ruined what humanity enjoyed, which was a wholeness and an intimacy with God. It caused this separation with God. God had to remove himself from being right among them because of the sin that had entered the world. The brokenness of our world, world that we know far too well is the ongoing result. But what many people fail to realize is since that moment, our God has been working towards restoration, wholeness, and healing for all that he has made. This is the overall story of the Bible. I mean, from the front cover to the back, this is the overall story of the Bible. God is striving to fix that. That's his desire. He created us to be with him. He didn't want to have to leave. He didn't want to have to remove himself. But he had no other choice because our God is perfect. Our God is holy. And where there is sin, he can't be. But then his son stepped in and paid the price, gave us that opportunity, imparted righteousness to us, so now we have that ability to be with our Lord and Savior again. Now throughout Scripture, we can see God making a way and giving and reminding his people of this hope that he is still at work. We see this in his covenant with Abraham, or at the time his name was Abram. Genesis 12.3 I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And now this covenant, it remained, but then it was ultimately renewed and reinforced the hope that God is st still working when God encountered Jacob at Bethel. Genesis 28, 15. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. 
Now, unfortunately, we know how things went for the Israelites. Many years, generations, even centuries go on. And this cry that they began to make, how long, O God? It was this recurring cry they would make. The Hebrew people, they followed this trend. When things got good, they tend to forget about God. They kind of were like, hey, things are going good. We don't really need you right now. But then when things got bad, what'd they do? They cried out to him. Where are you, God? Have you forsaken us? How long, O oh God? And they would do this vicious circle. How many of us here can relate to that? You go through a good season in life, and you're like, I got everything together. You know what, Lord? Thank you, but you can kind of just sit back here. Nope. He needs to be right there. You need to be with him, walking with him in every step. Because, yes, in the good times, things are going wonderful. But the Lord's right there strengthening you, encouraging you. So when the bad times come, you're not turning around saying, Lord, where are you? Because guess what his response is going to be? I'm right here. I'm with you. I've been with you the whole time. You just decided to stick me on the shelf for a little bit. But through it all, there was this deep and ongoing longing for God to fulfill his covenant, his promise of the Messiah, who would come to make everything right. Now, this wasn't just some happy idea that drifted in and out of the Israelites' consciousness and culture. This was a deep hope. This was their deepest hope. It sustained them and encouraged them. It spurred them on, especially through the thousands of years of uncertain waiting. It kept them moving forward. Now let's fast forward a little bit and turn our attention to the prophet Isaiah. When it comes to Advent, I would dare say that Isaiah would be considered the poster prophet. Like if we were to make advertisements, his face would be all over it. Because we read this morning, and you'll hear different references throughout this season from Isaiah, the prophecies that were made and then ultimately fulfilled. Isaiah was a voice of hope. You probably know many of his teachings and you're familiar with them. Scripture from the book of Isaiah is very popular around this time of year. He lived 700 years before Jesus. But he gives us these beautiful words that ring with hope for the coming of the Messiah. Listen to these. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting, Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this now could you imagine living in the time that the Israelites did way before anything digital iPhones anything like that or even much written information and you hear this I can only imagine the hope that would spring up in their heart. The hope that they would cling to when they heard this. Now you may be wondering, well, Pastor, did Isaiah understand all of these messages and promises? On some level, yes, he did. But on others, no, probably not. He sure didn't know God's time for when it would all happen and when the Messiah would come. But let me tell you, if he did, he'd be a very rich man. He could have made a lot of money off of that. Perhaps Isaiah thought it would be in his lifetime. I mean, wouldn't that have been wonderful? Or maybe he was wise enough to know that God's work stretched for generations and generations because we know God's timing is not our timing. What we think of as an hour and a day, the Lord thinks of in a very different way. But Isaiah was filled with hope and God's promises fueled him and his people to continue to hope for years and centuries. His vision of God with us it still fuels hope inside of us all these years later. Now, as we turn our attention to the Christmas narrative that we find in the book of Luke, we're introduced to Zechariah, who would have been well acquainted with the words and prophecies of Isaiah because he was a priest. This was his job. He was the one that was to be well-versed in it, to understand it, to convey it to the people, to be the go-between between God and the Jewish people. 
He was a good Jewish follower of God and described as righteous and blameless. He was the spiritual leader of the people, and he undoubtedly held a deep longing for the Messiah who had been promised. But all of a sudden, something happened. Zechariah was in shock. When out of the blue, you know, just an ordinary day, he's minding his business, going around, doing his thing, an angel of the Lord shows up and drops a mega dose of hope in his life. When the angel appeared before him, he told Zechariah he would have a son. And according to Luke 1.17, we read, And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Zechariah knew the significance. He knew the prophecies of the Messiah. And he also knew that this was a miraculous occurrence all the way around. Why? Well, him and his wife, Elizabeth, were not able to have children. And at this point, they were well in years. And it wasn't for a lack of trying. They desired to have children. But it just never happened. And so all of a sudden, this angel shows up and looks at him and says, you're going to have a son. Okay. So when Zechariah received this special delivery, he was a little bit in shock, to say the least, and he couldn't quite get over the part about him and his wife, who were very old, having a child. So he goes, me? Like, Lord, we're old. That is not possible, was his response. So guess what God does? He made sure that Zechariah remained literally silent until his son John was born. I mean, can you imagine? Silent for nine months until his son was born. Certainly this was an inconvenience as a priest, but can you imagine the hope that sprang up within not just this couple, but the people around them when they heard this news that, wait, Zechariah is going to have a son, and his son, according to Scripture, is going to be the one that prepares the way for the Messiah. So there's still hope that the Messiah is coming. Because at this point, it was many years after the fact of these prophecies, they're probably starting to wonder, is this actually going to happen? God is moving to restore hope that he is still that here, that the human expression of God with us is still coming, that God is about to stir things up and change eternity forever. Hope for Israel is alive again. Hope on earth at its deepest level was alive again. Now let's get real for a minute here. Maybe some of you are thinking, well, that's nice and all for those people, pastor, from thousands of years ago. But what about us? What about me? They weren't fighting cancer or some other illness. Their spouse wasn't killed overseas fighting for this country. Or even more, their, their spouse hasn't threatened to leave or walk out on them. They didn't lose their job unexpectedly right before Christmas with a mortgage to pay, food to have to put on the table, kids who were excited for gifts. That didn't happen to them. So it's nice and all that they have this hope. But what about me right now? What hope do I have? No matter what kind of problems and struggles you're facing right now, no matter what kind of season of darkness and pain you're in, let me encourage you, do not abandon hope. It is still alive. Even in our deepest pain and most hopeless circumstances, hope is alive for one reason and one reason only. God is with us. How can we know? How can we find that tiny spark of hope when we're on the verge of giving up? Well, there are several ways that we can find this. We can rekindle and reconnect with God's hope during this season, no matter what the circumstances we're facing. The first one this morning is this, hope based on God's word first and most importantly. Part of God with us is the written word that he left us. They're his promises to his people, yes, long ago, but also today. Don't ever forget that the Bible that we read from, that we believe in and teach from, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Scripture is the inspired word of God. I mean, for gracious sakes, it's one of the Assemblies of God's 16 fundamental truths, that Scripture is the inspired Word of God, the infallible Word of God, meaning without error. I'm amazed I was able to pull that from my memory. It's been very long since I've had to recall those. 
Scripture is alive, and it's certainly relevant to each and every one of us today. There are many people that will say, well, those, no, it's not relevant anymore. There's bits and pieces of that. Yeah, it was fine and well for then, but it has no relevance today. I'm sorry, but it does. It's very relevant to today. They are reminders that can penetrate our hearts and spirits and assure us that no matter what we are facing, no matter how bleak tomorrow looks, and no matter how bad the pain, God will never leave us or forsake us. And nothing can separate us from him according to the Apostle Paul in Romans 8. Look at Psalm 139, 7-12. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Can you feel and hear the hope in those words? You are not alone. God with us means that he will always be with us and nothing, absolutely nothing, can take that away or change that fact. Scripture is filled with stories and words and promises that can rekindle a supernatural hope within us. As we move through Advent, let me encourage you, dig into the words of the Bible expectantly because God is with us. We can take hope that we're never alone, that he is always working in and among us. And here's the best part. He is not done with us yet. He's got many great things to come. His greatest and final work of healing is still coming. Now, the second way that we can rekindle hope is to put our focus on God's character and on who he is and promises to be. So we look at hope based on God's character. There's a story in the book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 25 to 34. We're not going to read through it, but it's very easy to overlook. It is a very profound, a great story of hope. It's about a woman, we don't even know what her name is, with this bold hope. She has this bleeding disorder now for many years. We don't know why. It's not told to us why. Jesus is in town. He's teaching among the people. And as usual, there's not just a small group. There is, dare I say, a multitude of people. There are throngs of people around him. Shoulder to shoulder. I mean, you'd be lucky to push through these people. This woman has this bold hope that if I can just get to Jesus and touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. So what does she do? She goes to this crowd of people. She gets on her hands and knees, starts pushing through people, pushing past people's legs, on the ground, moving through. Probably seemed impossible, but guess what? She kept pushing because she had this hope that if she could get to him, she'd be healed. And now there's some of us here this morning that there's situations in our life it seems impossible. But we have this flicker of hope that if I can just get to the Savior's garment and touch the hem of it, I will be healed. I don't know what that situation is. It could be your family. It could be your job. It could be your relationship with God. But you need to push through. On your hands and knees, push through. When people are trying to step on you, when people are trying to discourage you, people are trying to tell you it's not worth it, you're not going to make it, Push through because of that hope that you have in your heart that if I can get to him and touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. So she's pushing through. She finally gets to him and she does it. She grabs onto it and she's healed just like that. But it doesn't go unnoticed. Jesus, in the middle of teaching and ministering to these people, he stops and he goes, who touched me? And <laughs> his disciples look at him and they're like, Lord, look at all these people. There's, <laughs> there's no way to know. They're probably thinking, like, is he serious right now? But Jesus knew, because in the moment that she touched him, he sensed that power rush through him, out of him, to heal her. And what does she do? She doesn't hide. She actually comes forward 
in fear of what she did and admits, Lord, it was me. I touched you. And what does he say to her? He goes, because of your faith, you are healed. Go. And she goes. Amazing that through all of that, she pushes through. And we see different stories of this. We see when the group of friends cuts the hole in the roof and lowers their paralyzed friend down into the house. I mean, could you imagine if we're here and all of a sudden the hole comes in the roof? I mean, hey, it'd be, give us an excuse to get a new roof. But all of a sudden, it's like, what in the world is going on? These guys had a hope knowing that if we could just get him to Jesus, he'll be healed. So they did it the most unconventional way possible. But they did it. This is our God. This is his character. Why? Because Jesus is worthy. He was and still is God with us. He fulfilled Israel's hope for the Messiah when he arrived that first Christmas. He fulfilled humanity's hopes for victory over death when he resurrected on that first Easter. And one day, this is my favorite, he will ultimately fulfill all hope and complete God's work of restoration for all of creation when he returns to establish his kingdom here among us and cast the devil out. This is the, the promise he left us. It's a foundation of confidence and boldness. Matthew 28, 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is a promise that fuels our hope because God is true to his character. Because of who he is, we can take hope in him. And as we continue looking at ways to rekindle the hope that is brought when God is with us, we need to look at and be reminded of something extremely important. And the third and final thing this morning we're going to look at is this. Hope based on God's faithfulness. How has God worked in your life? What are those moments and memories when you have experienced God's work in your life? You know the times that you had no doubt He was there and was working. Maybe it's recently. Maybe it was a long time ago. But in those circumstances, the presence of God was with you. Now, what does that have to do with hope, you're wondering? What do those memories have to do with you here and now? Well, gratitude brings, breeds hope. Thankfulness fosters hope. Acknowledgement and appreciation bring hope. And the best illustration I can think of for this is when the Israelites would build altars to the Lord. They served as altars of remembrance to where as they journeyed, they could look back and be like, that's where the Lord met us here. That's where the Lord met us here, and he was faithful. He renewed his faithfulness here. He renewed his faithfulness there. And guess what? We need to do the same in our walk with Jesus. There's going to be times in our life where we're wondering, Lord, where are you? And then all of a sudden, he's going to come through. He's going to come through in only the way that he can, show us his faithfulness, and guess what? That needs to serve as an altar of remembrance. Why? Because as we move forward, there's going to come another time. And we need to be able to look back and be like, but that's where he was faithful. And he's going to be faithful again. Let's build another one. And another one. And another one. And that is why last week I said there's something important, something very symbolic about coming before the Lord to an altar. You're laying something down before him. So when you leave, it's left there. But you can look back and be like, that's where I laid that down for him. And he came through for me in a powerful way. That's where when I lost my job, I came through and prayed and the Lord the next day had a better job offer. That's when our house was about to be foreclosed on. But all of a sudden, the Lord came through and we were able to make the payment and keep things moving forward. There are altars of remembrance. There are times in our life that we need to remember and use to fuel us forward. To be able to say, Lord, thank you for what you do. Lord, I thank you for the blessings that you give. We just did it on Thursday. We sat down as family and friends for a moment of just, not just fellowship and good food, but a moment of reflection and thankfulness for all that the Lord has done. But here's the thing. Just because some time ago the U.S. government decided that this Thursday in November is the day to do that doesn't mean it ends there. It needs to go beyond that. 
It needs to go each and every day that you wake up and say, Lord, thank you for waking me up this morning. Lord, thank you that I have a car to drive to work. Thank you that I have a job. Thank you that I have a loving family. Thank you for your son and the opportunity to serve you. Thank you for my church family. Thank you for the opportunity to be a witness among the people in my community. When we get out of that habit, we start to lose hope and wonder, Lord, what's going on? And all the Lord is saying is, I'm right here. I'm right here. Just get back into it. The words of the prophet Jeremiah, they really stand out in Lamentations 3.21 to 26. Now let's be honest. How many of us spend time reading the book of Lamentations? I mean, Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet, and now we're talking about the book of Lamentations where we're lamenting. But regardless, these verses are powerful. In chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Did you catch in the beginning where Jeremiah says, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. He understood that there is hope in the future when we remember what God has done in the past. He knew that hope sparks like a fire. It flows like water. It grows like a seed. Hope grows and spreads like a living thing. But remember, just like any living thing, it can dwindle and wane and, yes, even die. But with some nurture and care and some time, it can be revived to flourish and multiply once again. Focusing on gratitude can renew and grow our hope. Recognizing and appreciating the good that God has shown us in the past, that can increase our hope for all he will do in the future. Sharing this gratitude and hope with those who love and support us can multiply its effect. As we nurture this living hope, and we just sang about the living hope this morning, it can sustain us through our darkest days as we wait for God to move. And guess what? He will. He will. He may not do it when you want him to, because trust me, if that was the case, I'd be saying, Lord, move just right like now. Move right now. But he asks us to wait patiently, and he will. So as we prepare to conclude this first message about hope, as we're entering into the season of Advent, let's take a moment to reflect on all that God has done for us. Let's prepare our hearts as we eagerly await his return. So over the next few weeks, we will participate in family traditions. We'll gather for dinners, parties, concerts, services here at church, make final preparations for Christmas, everything that goes with that. Through all of that, let us not forget the true meaning of this Advent season, and that is this, that over 2,000 years ago, our Lord and Savior didn't just come, but he came to be with us. Prophecy was fulfilled, and we now await his return. As we close this morning, the altars, they're always open, as usual. I invite you, find a place this morning or from your seat, and just take a moment. Thank the Lord for what he has done, reflecting on the hope that has been brought to this earth, even though things may seem hopeless at times. Let us remember that through his word, his character, and his faithfulness, we are able to find hope this Advent season. I want to leave you with one scripture before we pray. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to just dive into your word. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son over 2,000 years ago, that he came not just to be born and to rule over us, but that he came to be with us that you are God with us. And even today, you're with us, you're among us. 
Lord, in this service, we thank you for all that you do. I pray for each person here, each person watching, that if they feel that sense of hopelessness, spur that desire in their heart. Remind them to take that moment to just reflect, to be thankful for what you've done, for what you're going to do, and help them get back on that path to bring that hope, to spark that hope alive again this Christmas season. Lord, be with us as we go about these next couple weeks with the busyness of everything, that we not lose sight of who you are and the hope that was brought over 2,000 years ago, the hope that is still alive and well today, and that's going to go with us, before us, and that it's with us in every situation that we face. We thank you for it. Be with each person here. Bless them. Bless each family. And just help them this Christmas season to turn their attention back to you, to focus on you. We thank you for all you do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. And don't forget, on your way out, the offering plate is in the back. Have a wonderful week.